thanks everyone for joining us at various potentially very early hours of the morning. Um, so our first discussion is on uh, supporting local journalism, which as we all know has been an especially hard hit uh, segment of the media the, over the last uh, couple decades. Uh, law school clinics and others have increasingly focused on supporting local journalism. And this discussion is, is meant to sort of explore and share strategies for, for how to do that. Um, I'll just very quickly introduce uh, the discussants. Um, and then we'll, I think we'll go around and, and first just describe a little bit about what we do to support local journalists in a, in a matter that we're, we're working on. So um, I'll just go alphabetically. So we have Josh Verde, who's an attorney at Lobby and Lobby. Um, Josh regularly represents clients, including local journalists in FOIA and First Amendment matters. Uh, Flavi Fuentes is the pro bono director for the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Um, she does a lot of work with Microsoft and Davis Wright and Tremaine to lead the Protecting Journalists Pro Bono program. Heather Murray is the managing attorney of the local journalism project at Cornell Law School First Amendment Clinic, um, where she advises local journalists and represents them in First Amendment public records and, and access litigation. And Susan Seeger is an adjunct uh, clinical professor at uh, UC Irvine's um, Intellectual Property Arts and Technology Clinic. Um, so why don't we qu quickly just go around and, and each of us can say a little bit about what we do to support local journalists and uh, a matter that we're working on. So why don't we start, I'll just go to my right with uh, Heather. Sure. So I'll start by talking about Cornell's local journalism project and then tell you about our most recent success story, which also happens to be perhaps the quickest win of my career thus far. So our clinic launched the project to give greater focus to the work we're doing on behalf of community news outlets and journalists. I manage the project and my colleague, Ava Lou Bell, who might be on the call by now, is our satellite local journalism attorney in New York City, which is a first for a Cornell clinic to my knowledge and perhaps for any clinic and work specifically with outlets there. Uh, our focus of our project is to work with small news outlets that need legal assistance to aid their investigative reporting. Among other things, we provide pre-publication advice, we craft records requests, litigate when those requests are denied, or when journalists are excluded from court proceedings, and we defend journalists against libel suits. We also recognize our clients' legal needs go beyond news gathering, journalism as a business, and local outlets need advice on a range of day-to-day -day legal and business issues, from hiring employees to entering into contracts, to converting to nonprofit status. So we have in the past year begun to provide this crucial counsel to support the operations of community newsrooms, including this semester teaming up with Cornell's entrepreneurship clinic to assist clients with their startup legal needs. And I for one am very grateful to have Ava as my colleague to help lead that work with her in-house corporate background. Uh, we have several clients that have done ongoing work with us over a series of months or years. And I found not surprisingly that this ongoing partnership with clients can make a greater impact than one-off cases. And this gets me briefly to my uh, clinic success story for today. Those of you who attended last year's panel met our client, Ann Galloway, who's the founder of investigative news site, VT Digger. And you heard how for several years and in three separate public records lawsuits, she had been seeking access to state documents that may shed a light on the state's oversight of several development projects gone wrong. Those projects turned out to be nothing more than an elaborate Ponzi scheme that immigrant investors were duped into funding. Some documents were released in each of those suits and our clinic was involved in two of those suits but many other documents had been withheld for months or years on the basis of privilege and because they purportedly fell under the state's litigation exemption. Our client came to us recently and to our fabulous co-counsel, I should mention them, Tim Cornell at Cornell Dolan and Leah Ernst at the ACLU of Vermont. And she said, I'd like to try to get these documents a different way. There's a federal criminal trial against the developers that were implicated in the Ponzi scheme, and a tranche of documents there have been filed under seal because of potential privilege concerns. What about getting them unsealed? And in an, a very unusual move, the same defendant that filed these documents under seal decided to file a motion to unseal the documents after he entered into a plea agreement so that he could use the documents to support his upcoming hearing seeking a reduced sentence for himself. So in his motion, he said, look, these documents show that the state knew about this fraud long before it acted on it. 
And he claimed that while these documents were marked privileged, the state had waived that privilege for a number of reasons. Uh, what the motion didn't do, and this is where we finally enter the picture, was make an obvious First Amendment or common law right of access argument for these sentencing documents or assert the great public interest in disclosure. So when defendants filed their brief, the state initially asserted the documents were privileged and that they opposed the unsealing. We filed an amicus brief the very next week asserting diggers and the public's right of access. And then less than a week after we filed the brief, the state actually withdrew its privilege objection instead of even putting in a brief opposing the motion and agreed that the documents should be unsealed. Um, and I should also highlight briefly the great work on the matter of our associate clinic director, Jared Carter, and our students, Alyssa Ertel, Andrew Galfan, Lauren Cosin, and Victoria Martin. Thanks a lot, Heather. Um... Josh, how about you? Sure. So the primary way that we're supporting local journalism is through litigation. At any given time, we have over 200 active cases. Most of those cases are Freedom of Information Act cases, but there's a number of others as well. So First Amendment cases, Open Meetings Act cases, just a variety of different government transparency related issues of litigation. Uh, before talking a little bit more about the litigation, I'll touch on some of the other ways we support local journalism. So one of those ways is uh, just routinely reaching out and uh, educating local journalists. That's through you know discussions, uh, panel talks not so uh, dissimilar from this one. And also, uh, journalists are regularly reaching out with questions. Just just a day or two ago, received a question regarding public bodies having meetings remotely on Zoom during the pandemic. And the question was, are they still allowed to do that? They were allowed to do it before, but can they do it now? And the answer to that question, you would think would be really simple, right? You just go look at a statute or an order and it would just say, yes, you're allowed to. But the reality was, it's not nearly that straightforward. You go to one statute and the statute says you can have the meetings remotely, you know, by Zoom or whatever, under these sets of circumstances. Then some sub provision of the statute directs you to governor's orders. You have to go, you know, look through the governor's orders and the governor's orders will have definitions that reference to totally other statutes. And you have to track the whole breadcrumb trail back to piece it together. And yes, the short answer was they can still have meetings remotely. But those are the types of questions that we're regularly having journalists reach out to us about. Uh, the other thing is just, just informing journalists about what their rights are and what the law says. They often don't realize that there are lawyers out there that can help them under these statutes for free, which is a really big deal as local journalists and even larger journalism organizations just don't have the money to, to, to pay hours, to pay lawyers an hourly rate. And so there are just really basic things like that, that the fact that they can have support and letting them know some of these different basic things is, is really helpful. So to talk a little bit more about litigation and give a specific example. One issue that I've been litigating for the past few years across a number of different cases is surveillance video footage. So I'm doing the local work I'm doing is in Illinois. So that's a lot in Chicago, but not just Chicago, it's throughout the state. And in particular, surveillance footage at the Illinois Department of Corrections. So you can probably imagine the way a lot of the Freedom of Information Act requests go for surveillance footage. There's lots of abuses, lots of guards beating prisoners or breaking their fingers or different allegations like that. Really horrific stuff being caught on camera and then various people request the surveillance footage that would just, right? No need to take anyone's word for it. You can just look at the video and see. And IDOC responds saying that video footage is exempt. Uh, it could, it could, you know, affect or relate to our security. So surveillance footage is just per se exempt. And as you can imagine, the arguments get a lot more detailed. But it's it's a pretty crazy position they take. 
And they're wrong on the law, but they're also wrong in terms of common sense. So one of the, or a couple of the arguments we've made are, well, look at all the other prisons that have released surveillance footage with you know, no security implications at all. And you know, they can't show any. And probably the, the most salient or craziest example was we litigated a case they said, we can't release this footage. IDOC says we can't release this footage. It would you know, affect our security. It would hurt our security. Can't release it, can't release it, can't release it. Well, the footage in question was a guard beating a prisoner for no reason at all. And the Illinois State Police had investigated it. And someone made the same request, our client made the same request to the Illinois State Police and the Illinois State Police just released it. No security concerns, right? And then still the you know, IDOC can't cite any harm coming out of that at all. And yet they're still fighting the release <clears throat> of that footage. And that's, that's a similar story across multiple cases. And the unfortunate reality is that the government affidavits sometimes, or the government affidavits always get deference from the courts for, you know, that's just what the law says, whether it's a you know, good reason or not. And so we're almost certainly going to be seeing, you know, some wins and some losses, and we're going to be seeing these cases go up on appeal in the near future. And I mean, suffice it to say, it's a it's a really big issue whether they're going to be able to keep these videos of guards beating prisoners and abusing them secret or not, because that's the position that the public bodies are taking right now. And I can certainly keep going, but I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks a lot, Josh. Uh, Susan? Hello, from California in my garage where I won't wake anyone up. Uh, so I'm at the UC Irvine uh, Intellectual Property Arts and Technology Clinic where we've started a press freedom and transparency practice and I'm grant funded for three years. This is my last year of grant funding. So I'll be out there beating the bushes. Um, and so I'm a former journalist. Maybe I'm always gonna be a journalist. And so I have a lot of connections, um, you know, in the, the journalist community still in, in Los Angeles. So that's really helped me to start from scratch that a lot of journalists knew me and called me for help. Um, and so I also did outreach to uh, like, for example, I, I noticed there's this new startup. There are a lot of new startups in LA and they had done a huge 15 part series on, believe it or not. And I don't know why the mainstream media isn't covering this in a more comprehensive way, but we have sheriff's deputies in Los Angeles who are, have started their own gangs. They call them cliques, um, but they're called the executioners. They have tattoos, the banditos, uh, the Vikings. You might guess that's a white supremacist gang. Anyway, so this very startup kind of volunteer shoestring um, website called Knock LA, which is part of Ground Game LA, um, did this 15 part series and they, the sheriff said he was gonna get you know, his deputies to sue them for defamation. So I, I reached out to them and I said, hey, I see the sheriff's you know, threatening you and I really love your work. It, you know, is there anything I could do? And so I did a newsroom seminar for them. Um, two of their reporters were arrested um, wrongfully by police. I'm um, teaming up with a, a local civil rights law firm that does these 1983 cases and they don't, they actually called me because they don't know about First Amendment stuff. So we're teaming up and um, probably going to do a civil rights lawsuit uh, on behalf of those reporters. And there are a lot of, a lot of lawsuits scattershot in LA. Um, unfortunately, there's no kind of big kind of class action or group lawsuit, but we're still hoping to get some reforms done if we, if we do do this lawsuit. So it's a great opportunity to pair up with someone who does these cases, but doesn't know about the First Amendment. So very excited about that. I also did a newsroom seminar for the local um, Society of Professional Journalists. And so I, you know, people, a lot of freelancers attend that, but also staff writers. And so I got a call, you know, from uh, some reporters out of that. So that's a way I did outreach. Um, and then not just because I, I just know so many people, um, that's really helped as well. Um, two projects um, we're working on are, one is police records, trying to get those through um, our public records law. And, uh, you know, California has adopted a couple 
great laws that are very late in coming, but allowing us to get more police records of discipline and criminal investigations of cops and shootings than we've ever gotten before. And so I've been able to spring loose uh, one of those in a, in a horrible shooting of a, an actor from ER and Stand and Deliver who had mental illness issues. And she was shot and killed, including by uh, an assault rifle here in my tiny town of South Pasadena of like 40,000 people. And they, I got horrible body footage, which I cannot bear to watch all the way through, but I got that for a documentary filmmaker. And um, that was through this new law where we got all the DA's interviews with the officers. And of course, the DA found they did nothing wrong because sadly she had a um, replica pistol, um, but they, you know, they escalated the situation horribly. So that was a, a great victory. And she's trying to get her documentary film out there, but it hasn't been picked up yet. And the other thing, I'm, we're kind of an expert with um, unsealing juvenile court records where the child has died under the jurisdiction of a juvenile court. And our client is Garrett Theroff, who used to work at the LA Times and then moved up and is a, a staffer at the UC Berkeley Journalism School. But I consider him a freelancer because he goes and you know sells his stuff to other people. So he's really kind of on his own in a way in terms of legal help. So we <clears throat> got a lot of documents for him. And one of my students, um, Ben Whittle, will be speaking about that in the next panel. Um, but he used it for a Netflix documentary, um, The Trials of Gabriel Fernandez. And that's been just an amazing journey because as you probably know, judges who operate in secrecy are really pissed when you come into their courtroom. And they, one, some judges have been fantastic to my students. In fact, they all have been, except for one who wouldn't let my students argue. They wouldn't let them come into the hearing via Zoom. Um, and we have to go back because we don't think we got all the documents we were entitled to. But that's a little niche business that we have that, um, and I, I think I met that source at Coachella for the, the uh, Wu-Tang Chan um, Clan headliner, if any of you were there. So that's how I got that client by being super cool. Um, and we have a joint project with the UVA clinic where we basically had a client who had a FOIA case and she was based in DC. So we basically turned it over to UVA, although we're, we're still sort of on the emails, but that was a great um, joint collaboration, one-sided kind of on their side. Uh, so I think that's all I have for now. We were going to talk about outreach, but I think the question has been answered by just go to Coachella. <laughs> um, Flavi, Flavi, do you want to say a little bit? Uh -huh. Thank you, Stephen. It's going to be hard uh, to be as cool as Susan. Uh, I didn't go to Coachella, uh, but I do my best. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, I, I feel like I, I don't need to introduce the reporters' committee's work, but for, for those who don't know what we do, we... Um, we protect uh, journalists, news gathering, and First Amendment rights through pro bono legal representation, um, amicus brief, and, and legal education in the forms of uh, guides and resources. What I think worth keeping in mind is that the Reporters Committee serves not only news organizations, reporters, editors, documentary filmmakers, but also media lawyers, which I think greatly contributes to the, ex the expansion of this pool of expert lawyers who can support the, the sector. On local journalism, I should say that although the, the Reporters Committee has always supported local uh, news outlets, its support became uh, even more intentional in um, 2019 with the creation of the, the local legal initiative thanks to a grant from the Knight Foundation. So basically through this initiative, the Reporters Committee embeds uh, lawyers across the country to defend uh, against legal threats and lawsuits, assist with public records, and provide a pre-publication review. Uh, what's really interesting is how, you know, the Reporters Committee um, uh, selected the five states where these lawyers are located. They basically reviewed more than uh, 45 submissions received from over 30 states and regions nationwide. And uh, after reviewing these, um, these uh, submissions, they selected the states of Colorado, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, and Tennessee. And um, 
these states were actually selected in, in light of several criteria, such as the presence of a diverse ecosystem, looking at the number and diversity of news organization, the existence of nonprofit news media in the jurisdiction, um, the, the types of legal needs, and, and whether a reporter's committee attorney would actually make an impact through access uh, related litigation and training, but also the, um, the pro bono assistance, which was already available. Um, so that's for the, the local uh, legal initiative. Now, uh, to tell you about what we are, uh, about our most recent initi initiative, uh, I guess I should tell you about the, the Protecting uh, Journalists Pro Bono Program, which is a, a program that was uh, launched last year by uh, DWT and Microsoft, uh, whose Protecting Journalism initiatives actually really seek to strengthen local news ecosystems, um, restore trust and confidence in news and, and provide cyber and legal security to journalists. So you should really see this program as the, the most recent program um, of the, the Microsoft Protecting Journalism uh, Initiative. And I have to say, I'm, I'm personally very excited about this pro bono program because it really, it's really unique in the sense that it's, uh, it creates a, a, a synergy between the, the legal, private, and nonprofit sectors to help journalists and news organizations uh, with their legal needs. So uh, this program is, is currently in the pilot phase, and it's um, the way it, it works is that it's receiving referrals from uh, three organizations, including the Reporters Committee, but also the First Amendment Coalition and the Washington Coalition for Open Government. And um, the reason why I am uh, working, I mean, uh, working as the pro bono director for the reporters committee is uh, through a grant that we received from the Knight Foundation. But my role is really to um, assist the, the, the new pro bono, uh, protecting journalists pro bono program um, with its growing list of clients, but also working with nonprofit, local newsrooms, um, law school clinics, and legal service organizations to promote interest in this initiative create new collaborations, uh, but also seek additional law firms and corporate uh, legal departments to join the program. I would just um, end by saying that um, currently the, the scope of this program is uh, consists of three work streams, which you know, were largely drawn from the DWT's experience. And these three work streams are uh, pre-publication review, access to public records, and defending journalists against uh, subpoenas. Uh, the pilot was launched in Washington State and uh, California, with exceptions, you know, nationally for pre-pub uh, review matters. Um, and uh, we are uh, currently working on a, a feasibility study, which includes a landscape analysis uh, with a survey that will go out uh, very soon to our partners and, uh, and whose, re whose uh, results, I think, will benefit the, the whole um, community. So that's really exciting. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll just say a little bit about what we do at the Media Freedom and Information Access Clinic. Um, we, um, like I think the other clinics here, do a substantial amount of work in public records matters, access matters, um, defending libel and other news gathering uh, rights. Uh, we, um, we've recently been expanding into a number of different jurisdictions in these issues, in these matters. So we have public records uh, cases and I think four different states as well as um, before several federal agencies. Um, and, and the matter I wanna talk about is a, an access matter that we are uh, currently working on in Puerto Rico. And I see that our wonderful co-counsel Rafeli Gonzalez is here too. Um, so this case arises out of a, um, a motion to access recordings of uh, domestic violence hearings in which a, um, a victim of domestic violence sought protection from the courts um, three different times, was denied each time, and then was murdered by her ex-partner. So the Puerto Rican press is trying to figure out what, uh, what went wrong in these court proceedings that prevented her from, from getting protection. Um, so they made, an, uh, they made a motion to access um, the records I'm going to skip over some of the procedural details, but basically before the motion could be heard by the trial court, the Puerto Rico Supreme Court came in, took the case, and in the very same order, denied the motion. 
um, it held that Puerto Rican law categorically bars access to domestic violence proceedings and any uh, recordings of them. So our client had no opportunity to even brief the issues in the, in the um, trial court or before the Puerto Rico Supreme Court until its motions for reconsideration, which were summarily denied. So um, we're seeking review in the, in the US Supreme Court of those decisions. Um, that, that case I think is really important because Puerto Rico, um, like several other parts of the country is undergoing a pretty severe domestic violence problem, which has only been exacerbated by the pandemic. And um, it's important for um, for the press and the public to understand the roots of the issues in order to address them. So I think now let's open up for a, for a broader discussion. Um, and, and those who are in the audience can, can feel free to, to, jump, to jump in on the chats if they have any thoughts. Um, one, one, uh, one question that I think all of us have um, is just sort of how best to conduct outreach. So we all have um, to one degree or another sort of some established um, presence, but several of us I think have found it um, harder than we might've expected to match um, you know, our services with people who we know need them. And that may be a matter of outreach. It may be a matter of um, trying to tailor our services to what um, to what's most needed. So I'm I'm wondering if if um, uh, if anyone has any thoughts about their best practices, how they've conducted outreach in a successful way. So anyone can feel free to jump in. I'll just I'll jump in. I already did talk about this a bit, but one thing that it's taken me a while. It's my third year now. I'm, you know, I'm really, really busy and our docket is full and I have more work than I can handle. But in the beginning, I, I sent, you know, emails to sort of startups or independent websites and I heard back nothing. So that didn't work. Um, offering free legal services. Uh, so it really kind of happened by word of mouth. I tweet um, and I follow local journalists, um, especially those who have been arrested. Um, and I tweet often that you know, everyone has a right to peacefully film police officers because that's a pretty big deal here in LA as it is in a lot of cities over the last year. And, um, and then, as I said before, I, you know, I reached out to um, a local journalist and, and offered to do basically a, a lot of um, requests for police records. So I'm, you know, that's how I started with them. And then it, it kind of grew with these, with this arrest case and this other law firm. Um, I think, I think it, and I think the newsroom seminars are really helpful um, to local journalist groups. I think that really helped me as well. Um, and then just once you get, you know, going and we do, you know, we try to, I do press releases when we do um, file lawsuits. And um, I, I, my first year I did a, uh, I did a press conference where only one person showed up, but it, it was during Christmas, um, but it was about um, the top, I guess the, the libel bully of the year award, um, which was <laughs> Devin Nunes, um, who is a California Congress person who sued people who, for mocking him on Twitter. And so I, I, uh, that, that didn't really work very well, though I would like to kind of resurrect that because I think that's kind of a fun project. <laughs> so, um, and then I think other clinics um, have reached out for me just sort of to talk about things, but I haven't I haven't done anything with other clinics except at UVA. Um, and that everyone's, I'm so far away, I'm out here in California, so I'm kind of by myself. But it's, you know, now it's really chugging along quite nicely, but it did, it did take me a while. Yeah, I can chime in, Susan. I, I think our experience is similar to yours. Um, you know, we put significant investments into outreach through a variety of, of channels. And, and both when I started and, and then when, when Ava started, we spent a, a few weeks doing, doing a lot of, of outreach before we even really dug into um, some of our, our cases. Um, and we did it in a variety of ways. We have uh, relationships with state press associations um, who refer cases to us and who also um, put notices in their newsletters for us and who connect us directly to journalists that need assistance. 
Um, we work regularly with uh, the Pennsylvania Local Legal Initiative Attorney at the Reporters Committee, Paula Burke, who is great. Um, we also uh, work with, with CUNY. They have a Center for Community Media and um, specific networks for underrepresented journalists. Uh, they have a Black media initiative, a Latino media initiative that works along the border. They've referred clients to us and they've also had us in for trainings as well. Um, and then uh, we also get referrals from clinics and have worked with other clinics on projects and including uh, Yale and ASU. So. I would in large part echo what we've heard Susan and, and Heather say. I think, you know, you two hit the nail on the head going around, giving different newsroom seminars, giving different talks attending different talks, different journalism events where you can just go and more more casually just interact with people. I mean, we're at a similar place where ultimately at this point, everything, we're getting everything through just word of mouth, right? Journalists telling other journalists about us or, you know, they've seen some of the work we've done in the news and, and that's how we're getting everyone now. But it's definitely just just being out there ultimately and talking to people answering journalist questions, just being there to help them out, even if it's not, you know, litigating a case or anything like that. One thing that can be done, uh, we heard it touched on briefly, when you're, when you're just starting up, if you don't have a lot of connections is, you know, social media is a good option. And also, I mean, you can use things like Google AdWords, for example. And, you know, if you're working with the Freedom of Information Act, then you can use those keywords. And when someone's Googling that, you know, just have wh whatever it is you're doing, your clinic be the thing that comes up first. And so those are just a, just a few of the ways that, that we've gone about it. Yeah, Josh, I, that is next level. I need AdWords training now. <laughs> yeah, we, we all want that. Please, let's do a training, please. Um, I just wanted to add that at the national level, what has worked well for the reporters committee is to um, craft uh, partnerships with um, organizations like uh, the Fund for Investigative Journalism or the Freelance Investing uh, Investigative Reporters um, um, by really offering like specific support. So for example, with these organizations, we provide uh, pre-publication assistance uh, to the, the members, the grantees, and that has worked uh, very well, this kind of targeted outreach. And then at the, at the local level, um, I think it's important to highlight that the, at the reporters committee, you know, we are, we are when we are doing this outreach exercise, we are really committed to supporting both local and diverse journalism. And um, I wanted to mention the, the um, Borales Philanthropies Racial Equity in Journalism, uh, journalism Fund, uh, thanks to which we, we were able to hire a legal fellow, um, Kamesha Mori, which is great. And uh, Kamesha, you know, has been really focusing on identifying, supporting, and uh, addressing the legal needs of journalists of color, as well as newsrooms led by people of color and, and reporters covering issues that ultimately impact communities of color across the country. So um, we have a question from Dave um, in the chat. He, he wants to know, he wants to hear more about the, the Microsoft um, DWT program and, and Flavia, I guess this is a question mostly for you and specifically if there's a way that clinics can help with its expansion and collaborate with it with it more generally. Yeah, totally Dave. So as I said, right now I'm going through this uh, landscape analysis, uh, which you know, uh, includes uh, areas uh, of collaboration with um, law firms, additional corporate partners and obviously um, law clinics. I mean, most of you know that uh, the Reporters Committee um, helps coordinate the, the Free Expression Legal Network, which is a nationwide network of, of law school clinics. And so because of, you know, this, uh, um, this leadership role that we have been playing so far, we are in a very good uh, position to, um, to reach out to law clinics and make sure that they would be involved in this new program. It is very early stage, but you know I've been talking with uh, with people um, like Mark Johnson, and you know picking you know uh, their brain on how we can uh, ensure that law clinics are 
uh, an integral part of this program. So uh, I would say that it's it's uh, we are going through this uh, landscape analysis, but law clinics are definitely uh, a part of of these um, of these analysis, and uh, and we will reach out uh, in in due course. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Um, I want to I want to mention also. Um, so David Collier mentioned another the, the state coalition for open government um, as another potential network. One that that we've gotten a couple cases from is the Gumshoe Group, which is a group that refers um, or I guess pairs up um, pro bono lawyers with freelance journalists. Um, they they have some really great journalists working with them. So that's another another network uh, to reach out to. Um, another question that we had was about um, support, supporting local journalists in, in matters that are not litigation. So um, a couple of people have talked about pre-publication review and Heather, I know you do some transactional work. Um, one, one question I have is how, how best to do pre-publication review in a clinic setting where um, the turnaround time is often quite quick and maybe um, hard for students to to sort of do on the timelines that the clients need them. So if anyone has best practices for that, that would be really interesting to hear about. Yeah, it's a good question, Stephen. And I wouldn't say that we have best practices at this point because we're just starting to involve students in this work. Uh, we've done, you know, some of, some of it ourselves previously. Um, but uh, my colleague Ava did a training last semester and is doing another training this semester specifically for, um, for students to get involved. Uh, and then we pick particular projects where the timeline is not uh, immediate, where you have a week, two weeks or more. Uh, and this, the student can be involved from the start with both with meeting with the client um, to, to, you know, to, to hear about the story and then reviewing themselves and then meeting, meeting with one of us. Uh, and, and I, you know, that's going, going well so far. Um, and, and we have, a another, uh, project right now, um, with a journalist out in Syracuse, um, that, that Ava has largely handled where it's re reviewing a, a six, six piece documentary series. Uh, and on that, while the students weren't directly involved, we're going to have a, a you know a, a, an interactive talk with Ava and the journalists, and the students will be able to learn from that. So, um, I've done pre-publication review as well. I we did a documentary film that was um, from the UC Berkeley uh, Journalism School. Uh, so I did that myself because it was over the summer. Um, we we did a pre-pub review of a podcast. Um, a couple podcasts actually. Um, one of them was my former student because I teach at USC Journalism School as well. And it's and we did also a, a big investigative piece we paired with UC, USC Journalism School. They had a project for a while on some scandals at the school. And it's really hard, I have to say, it is very fast moving, but um, I have to take the lead really, but I, um, but I, I, my students really loved it and we did sort of do things quickly, but they were they were sort of shocked at some of the pushback, which was a little bit rude. Um, and so just <laughs> I think they got a sense of that sort of push and pull sometimes that you get with pre-pub review. And um, so I haven't had any lately. It was it was a great um, experience for my students though. And I um, it just it just sort of comes and goes. I guess I I haven't done any in a while. But when we did, it was hectic but rewarding. So we have a team at, at Mafia that, that does pre-pub review and other um, services for documentary filmmakers that's led by Sandy Barron and Jennifer Borg, who I think are, are both here today. Um, they, so they, they have a good stream of clients and can kind of keep up a, a team that's dedicated to this. Do you have pre-pub review teams that are in place for a, for a semester? I mean, when you do it for a semester? Or is it something that gets tacked on to another team that may have less work? We've tacked it on as opposed to having teams that just do specifically that. We're gonna to have to be a very large project, I think, in, in order to <laughs> occupy a student's time for a full semester, so. Sounds good. And Heather, do you wanna talk a little bit about your um, transactional work? Cause that seemed like an interesting, uh, 
uh, sure. type of work that not a lot of not a lot of clinics, I think, do. Sure, um, and we've just recently uh, started to get students involved in this. Um, and this was actually an an idea of Mark's. So. Um, during a, like a number of meet and greets that we had potential, with potential clients over the past year, we were repeatedly getting asked for non-litigation help, you know, advice on how to structure and grow outlets, how to protect intellectual pro property, et cetera. Uh, initially, we just handled some of this work on our own. And, and when I say we, I mean largely my colleague, Ava, who has a corporate background. Um, and then we were looking to expand that work and we approached the Cornell's entrepreneurship clinic to partner with us. And so now what we're doing is we have a student from our clinic and students from the entrepreneurship clinic that are together working on projects. Uh, for this semester, it's a pilot. So we have two projects for two clients uh, and we're doing a variety of work for them reviewing um, contracts, uh, updating a privacy policy. One of them is looking to potentially convert to nonprofit status and wants to know the pros and cons. Uh, another one is looking at uh, joint venture agreements and needs advice on that. Um, so this is really just started, but it's going very well so far. And I think it's, it's nice for the students because they can get a more holistic view of what it would be like to be a, a, a media attorney in-house, so. Flavia, is, does the Reporters Committee have any resources or, or sort of spaces for clinics to collaborate with, with you on these sorts of matters? Yeah, I was actually thinking that it's great that uh, your, your clinic um, offers this type of support either because it's very critical. And to be honest, uh, we receive, you know, like lots of requests from newsrooms that need employment lawyers, tax lawyers, uh, and... Uh, because we cannot, um, because it's out of our, you know, um, scope, you know, we, we need to refer them to organizations such as uh, um, lawyers for uh, reporters or we the action. Um, so knowing that you, um, you are now, you know, providing this type of support is great. And uh, we make sure to uh, refer these newsrooms um, to you. I think, uh, you know, it really raises the question of how can we make sure when we are supporting a journalist and newsroom, um, as you said, Heather, to, to have like a holistic approach, you know, I think that we have to keep in mind that these organizations are very often very small, have very limited resources, sometimes it's a two, three, you know, uh, people um, thing. And so I think that being able to act as a one-stop shop for this organization is really important. And it's, it can be either, you know, like through referral. So, you know, making sure that we have a list to share with them, go to these organizations or go to this law clinic or being able to offer all the, the legal services um, in the same place. But I think it's very critical. So it's great. And what we do is we refer, um, we refer one of our journalism clients that weren't they didn't have an LLC or anything um, to our clinic here that does startups. So, mm -hmm. um, and they did already have a meeting. <clears throat> so that's been kind of helpful <clears throat> for at least one client. So I think we're at time for this discussion and I don't want to eat into the next groups. Um, I see Dave's typing something. Um, I think we are. Hey, Steve, sorry, Dave. Let's go ahead. Five minutes or so. If there's further things, I don't want to cut it off. Okay, sure. Um, sorry, Susan, did you type something in here? Yeah, I'm just saying oh. the funding is hard to get. Stanton approaches you, you don't approach them, and they do broad based First Amendment funding. We got our funding from the um, Legal Clinic Fund, and uh, they get, did two rounds of funding. So you might look into that and um, they want you to get your own funding after a bit, but they, they do do seed funding and I don't know. They do only expanding existing clinics, but I, I squeaked in because I taught part-time and so we're like, we already have a clinic. We're just expanding it, <laughs> <laughs> but it's tough. I feel your pain. Steven, can I, can I say something just- Absolutely. When uh, Mark Jackson from the Cornell First Amendment Clinic, I, it just occurs to me that when we talk about networking, uh, that
that sometimes the networking isn't too new and different. Sometimes the networking is within your existing client base. And I think one of the important things that a clinic can do is develop this relationship with certain clients uh, and challenge them to do more uh, investigative, better investigative, knowing that they have the legal team behind them. So it's, it's actually, uh, you know, sort of developing a deeper relationship with your client and sort of creating your own docket in a way which actually uh, helps both the clinic, but of course, journalism as well. Yeah, I totally agree with what Mark said. That's definitely a lot of what we've done. I mean, we've had clients who came to us with, oh, maybe there's this one case we want to pursue and then extrapolate a few years down the road. It's 10, 15, 20 cases a year. Yeah, and this is Dave. I just wanted to also add to, to some of that. I, I think that um, one thing that the clinics, particularly the, the FELN network, um, could be thinking about is, is working more with the Reporters Committee regional lawyers. I think one of the concerns many people have, particularly doing like pre-pub review and things, if you're not experienced at it, it's, it's hard to do. Uh, or to take on a case that you know needs a local counsel, and I, I just think there's ways to leverage what the reporters committee is doing with the work of the clinics, and would encourage people to reach out to uh, either the lawyers committee or to to the local lawyers directly. And I think yesterday <clears throat> um, Bruce talked about where they were, but you know they're in five or six states now, and. Um, Hopefully, that, that I continue. Yeah. So I, there's a number of ways. I think there's a number of resources out there now for the, the clinics that, particularly ones that are just starting up in their first or second year and are looking for either um, assistance or ideas or um, you know some expertise to to coordinate with the reporters committee teams. So we probably should wrap this up. We're going to go right into our next panel. If anyone had a final word, I, I don't want to cut it off, but. No, I think you could go ahead, Dave. Okay. So if the next panel would turn their cameras on, uh, and we're going to go right into, this is another. Um, Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you all. This was, was a terrific discussion and um, a lot of ideas there. Uh, appreciate your time.